Hello, I'm going to be speaking about kabuki theatre. So why I chose to explore kabuki theatre is because I'm really interested in Japanese culture, their food, their music, their dance, so I thought I might as well look into their theatre. And kabuki attracted me over the other Japanese theatre types because of the way it looks. Like, it looks really beautiful and it looks sophisticated and like a lot of, um, that there's a strong process behind it which I wanted to find out more about. So I was interested in the physicality and the training that is entailed to become a kabuki actor. So kabuki, kabuki is Japanese for song, dance and perform and it was founded in 1596 by a female called Izumo no Okuni and she was in the streets imitating the Buddhist monks at the time because Buddhism was the, one of the main religions at the time and this attracted an audience and from there stemmed the theatre company or the, the people who performed it um, and originally they were performing and they used this as an opportunity to attract male suitors for their prostitution so the government banned them and restricted it solely to men but the young men also did the same thing and used it to attract um, for their prostitution so it was restricted only to older men and that meant that older men had to multi-role as male and female and when an older man um, multi-roles it's called Oma Gata. So this kabuki became really prevalent between the mid 17th to early 18th century and because of how <clears throat> because of how much it grew and how many people how much people enjoyed it, the government said that they had to live in their own quarters because they had such a big influence on the societies. So the government, um, the shogun at the time's advisor of Yusarai, um, he said this quote, which I found in Audience and Action Actors: A Study of Their Interactions in the Japanese Traditional Theatre by Jacob Brandt. It says, people are easily influenced by the behaviours of actors and prostitutes. Recently there has been a tendency for even high-ranking people to use the argo of actors and prostitutes. Such a tendency will result in the collapse of social order. And I found this really significant, and through the rest of my research I found that many females would even go to the performances to look at the onagata's actions and their etiquette and their mannerisms and try and pick it up, because they showed more etiquette than the females at the time so the fact that people went there to learn as well and to pick up habits is why it was so important that they behaved and that the plays were appropriate which is why the government had so much so many restrictions upon it so because kabuki stemmed post civil war yeah, at a time when japan was isolated from other countries a lot of the plays are quite domesticated and they're based in japan but it also means that within the country in different states, they have kabuki of different dialects, which would slightly differ. So if you had kabuki of Edo and kabuki of Kamigata, they would both um, they would both interpret the same play in a different way, adding their own slang or different um, argo or different ways of making it comedic um, at times. So you have kabuki of Edo, which is about the rawness and harshness of the city, and you've got kabuki of Kamigata, which is about good breeding and quiet ways of the imperial court. So they both would differ. Um, that way. And then you've also got different types of plays. So you've got the Jidai Mono, which are the historical melodramas, you've got the Suai Mono, which are the domestic plays and the love affairs, and you've got the Shosha Gotan, which are the dance dramas. Um, and people would go to see whichever play they would prefer. Um, but then they would also go depending on the actors that they like. So Kabuki actors, they train from as young as four to five years old. and um, up until they're 40 or 50, is well, and that's when they become professional actors. And um, they keep it in the family, so it's quite fun to you be trained up by other members of your family. So actors often went to go and see the people rather than the plays, but they still have different types of plays that they find important. Now the plays are split into three main parts, the jaw, the heart, and the cue. The jaw is the slow introduction to the play, the heart is the second, third, and fourth section in the middle, which builds up tension and introduces characters, and you've got the cue at the end, which is the resolution. And um, the, this, is, this kind of reminds me of Freytag's narrative arc, which follows the same kind of structure. When you introduce the characters, then you have the moment of high tension, and then you have a resolution at the end. Now, the costumes and the makeup is what really stood out to me about Kabuki Theatre, because it looks so beautiful. And they put a lot of time and consideration into the costumes that they have. So for domestic dramas, they usually wear quite basic kimonos, but for the historical ones, they have very extravagant robes, robe, um, robes and um, they would wear kimonos with different colours that signify things. So red would be 
um, passion or superhuman ability, and blue would be more about jealousy and fearfulness. So, um, the, at these costumes, they would wear them for the whole 25 days that they would perform this play. And after that, they would have to throw it away because if the colours fade, it will change the meaning of what the characters embody. So from this, I've learned that kabuki is actually a lot about physicality and appearances and how it looks and what your physicality does to change the meaning of the play or to affect the meaning of the scene. Now, unlike with no theatre, which uses masks, which is another type of Japanese theatre, they are kabuki artists who use makeup instead, and they use this makeup to exaggerate their facial lines. Um, and they would also use colour as well with the uh, makeup that they put on their face. And this is used also to emphasise the neo, which is a freeze frame, which I'll talk more about it, um, later. Now the theatre itself was quite a sociable aspect. They would, you'd go there with your friends, you would pay for a box on the ground where you would all sit, um, and they would shout remarks at these actors that I said that they would know and they would support. So there, there would be um, things that they would usually expect to say to certain actors, and it would be quite a feel-good experience. And they were speaking old Japanese, so it meant that the physicality was even more important, especially for modern audiences who are still watching um, Kabuki, which is an unchanging tradition, because they wouldn't necessarily understand everything, but through the physicality, you would get the gist of the story, and you'd still be able to understand the emotions of the characters. So the stage itself started quite basically with um, three elements. I found this image in one of the books that I used for my research. And um, as, this stage, as time went on, the stage progressed. So they have revolving doors, they have um, revolving stages, trap doors, and something called a hanamichi. Now, hanamichi is the entrance and the exit that the actors use. And three stamps along is called the shichi shan, which is where they form a meeting, which I'll still talk about later. <coughs> So then I decided to explore it practically through watching YouTube videos of um, performances and seeing how the actors acted and um, I started analysing the physicality of it. And I also went to a um, to Goldsmiths University for a workshop on Kabuki Theatre where they taught me more about the intention behind the physicality and how um, the different stock characters almost differ. So you have the Araboto which is a superhero or a villain, and they would, they're their male character, and they would have strong arms and outturned feet, and they would be quite an aggressive character who would be quite stocky, whereas you would have a wagato, which still played by Onagata, so a male player and a female, but would be more of a feminine, romantic character. And instead of stomping, they would glide, and they would walk with their hands together, and their head would tilt as they walk. And Bear in mind, they'll be wearing a kimono, so their arms and legs will be covered, and you just see them moving almost like a creature that would look really graceful and beautiful. Now, I was from, uh, Professor Thomas Simon said, the kabuki actor cannot go far enough in tremendous exaggeration of every gesture, which put in my mind the emphasis that is on how big their physicality is. And he also said, and at the time of this vivid series of gestures, its progression was carefully worked out, he actually freezes for a moment or two in what is called a mini a dazzling picture that puts itself on the spectators of the retina, which I think sums up Mie very well. A Mie is a freeze frame that, an actor, that actors do in a scene which, embody, which highlights certain specific moments of high tension or dramatic moments. So here is an example of a Mie. Theatre, in kits and props, as well as specific plays, language and actors. So as you can see, the actor has frozen, he would have people behind him who would help him hold up the costume to even accentuate the moment even more. So I'm going to be performing this section of Mie using what I've learned about it. So I looked at a Japanese play which was translated into English, and this is about a father who was, dis um, who was angry at his daughter for not marrying who he wanted. So the line is, would you do so baby, you are feeling your hussy. Ah yes, I'll show you. And then he picks up a hatchet and he goes to hit his daughter. So I will not be saying this line because they would have had um, music and the actors would have vocal training to make this sound really dramatic and realistic. But I'm going to be acting as if I have just said it and I'm about to hit the daughter. So to perform a mie, the actors would take a, a big step so that the audience can see what they're doing and they'd have to plant their foot firmly into the ground and they would lift their hands up with their palms outstretched to indicate to not only the audience but to the other musicians and the actors what they're doing and they would go into the position that they were going to freeze in and they would have to hold it with 
such high tension that they don't move at all. So when I was watching videos, I was amazed by the, the, their capacity to freeze to, with such strength that you could not even see that they're moving. And this is everyone on stage freezing at the same time, which you rarely see in Western theatre, I would say. Um, and then their facial expression also would portray how they're feeling. So I'm going to be portraying anger through my mirror, and I'm going to attempt to freeze as they would. So that would be my Mio. When I was practicing doing this, I had to practice arm exercises and leg exercises to try and increase my ability to have high tension in my body. So I would squeeze and unsqueeze. I saw these rehearsal processes online. Um, and I would have to try and make sure that my face would stay in the position that I wanted it to. And if I were an actual kabuki artist or actor, I feel like I would be able to be off balance and be able to hold that better. Um, and I feel like this process has really given me a newfound appreciation for the amount of practice that goes into it. So as I said initially, um, I was watching Kabuki and I thought it was really beautiful and I didn't actually analyse how much or how difficult what they were doing was. So even holding a freeze like this, it means that your legs are tensed, your arms are tensed, you have to have core balance, you have to have balance through your squeezing your core and it's a really difficult practice which I have a newfound appreciation for. And I could compare it to physicality with Burkhoff. Um, I've studied Burkhoff before um, during my IB course and know that he has, a, he has a lot of tension in some of his plays and the physicality of his moments. And both Kabuki and Burkhoff really focus on physical expression and the idea of exaggeration. So instead of just going like this, you have to let the audience be aware of what you're doing and freeze and hold it. And this exaggerated moment is what I feel is very successful in both Burkhoff and Kabuki plays, um, which I really admire. Now, following this presentation, I feel like I have learned a lot about myself and about myself as an actor because before I would focus more on words and ver verbal ways of communication, um, of performance instead of physicality. But now I've realised that, first of physicality, being very expressive with your body is a difficult thing to do, but also that there's a lot of training that goes behind it, and if I want to, well in the future when I try to add more physicality into plays, I know I'm going to have to practice it a lot, and I'm going to have to strengthen my body and work on myself, which is something that these Kabuki artists do, but from the age of four all the way up to when they're trained and adults. So from this experience I've learned a lot about myself, I've learned about more about Japanese culture, which I really appreciate and admire, and I aspire to use this in the future.